the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. On this day, we celebrate the triumph of Orthodoxy, and more specifically, the restoration of the icons in the worship of the Orthodox Church. This predates, by the way, the division of the Eastern and the Western Churches, so technically it could be a celebration that would include all of us. So, so why would the restoration of icons be a triumph of the Orthodox, that is the correct believing faith, both East and West? It's an affirmation of the incarnation of the Lord himself. In the original prescriptions against proscriptions, against the images in the Old Testament, we know that this was because God, a spirit, could not be depicted. Any image of God from the Old Testament would be, in essence, an idol, a false image. With the incarnation, now we can depict God in the flesh. We can depict the incarnate Lord. While we cannot depict his essence, we can depict Christ in the flesh. Jesus Christ, the Logos, the second person of the Trinity, is indeed a person. To depict his flesh is to depict him. This is also part of the triumph of Orthodox thought in that we understand that there is only one person in the incarnate Christ. There were ancient heresies that abounded that one of them said that Christ did not appear in the flesh, or that his appearance was an illusion of a real incarnation, we call it docetism. Another said that in Christ there were, there were two persons, as it were, the Logos of God and the man, Jesus Christ, and historianism. But we understand that Christ is one person in two natures, that to, to depict the man, Jesus Christ, is to depict the person. That's well and good concerning Christ, but what about the saints? Why do we have icons of the saints, and why do we venerate these icons? It's fairly simple, because each of the saints is an icon of the Lord as well. They were historical figures, real people who could be depicted, but they are also images of Christ. Or rather, I should say, they are persons who have attained unto the likeness of Christ. Then we can ask ourselves, how can we offer veneration, not worship, but veneration to an image? You know, how does that work? How does the veneration pass on to the prototype, as it were? Well, one thing I'd say is, it's a mystery. We like saying that in the, in the church. It's a mystery. I could leave it there, but that wouldn't satisfy anybody who is not orthodox. It's a mystery. They go, well, what do you mean by that? You know, that, that would just open more, up more of a can of worms, so to speak. But there is a way that we can understand this that might help in explaining to non-orthodox how the veneration passes on to the subject of the image. I say this because our use of icons is one of the major stomach blocks to people who are not orthodox in approaching our faith. If we are asked about this or confronted, sometimes it can be like that. We can be confronted by people. Well, why do you do that? It's important to be calm when confronted, I should say. Ask if the person <coughs> says the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. It works much the same way. We're not really pledging allegiance to a piece of cloth, but to the country for which it stands. You know, how do we feel when the flag is burned? When you see a flag being burned, how do you feel? You feel upset. You feel attacked. And how do we feel when the flag is honored? We feel honored. It's the same thing with the images of the saints, but it goes deeper, much deeper than that. We're lucky that we have computers these days. This is another, another way to look at it. Because they can be a great tool in teaching others about how icons work. And I don't mean because of Google or the information on the internet. I mean specifically the computer programs themselves, their very nature. If we look at a desktop on a computer, we see a lot of little pictures. And what do those, those computer programmers, what do they call those, those little pictures? They call them icons. And what happens when we click on an icon? We open the program. We can show this to a non-orthodox and ask this question. Is the icon on the computer the program itself? Or is it a means of opening the program? They're means of opening the program. They're not the program itself. We call icons windows into heaven, and this is accurate. They are not the saints themselves. They are not Christ or the Theotokos. They're the windows to them. Remember the days before cell phones when, when our moms would stick their head out the window and yell and call for you to come in for supper or, or to come home? Well, I do. I'm dating myself, of course. So when we click on an icon in a computer, we open that program. When we kiss an icon in the in our church or a home, we open the window to call for them. 
Like her mom come, hey, come home. We kiss them on icon. We're going, hey, we're here. And they can call back. That's the amazing thing. They can call back. We've seen this in the numerous icons that have left her or have been wonder working. I mean, the icons themselves are not wonder working, but it's the Lord works through the image and through the saint. The Lord works through the icons to reach others. And this is very important for us to remember because we are also icons of the Lord, each one of us. And other people are icons, icons of the Lord for us. In today's gospel, we heard St. Philip say, come and see, when Nathaniel questioned him about Jesus being the Messiah. Philip had said, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This tells us that Philip and others had been diligently seeking the Messiah. They had been seeking and the Lord found them first and called them to himself. When Philip had heard, follow me, he immediately did so and then went to find his friend and bring him along. He said to the, uh, he and the other disciples had a distinct advantage though. They knew the scriptures and were looking for the Messiah and when Christ came in the flesh, they could come and see. They could meet faith Christ face to face. They could touch him. They could hear his voice. And we see that Nathaniel did come and see it. He believed in Christ based on that meeting. There were even witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord. They were even witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord. The Lord even said to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The Lord knew, of course, he did. And of course he did that there would be generations of believers who would not have the advantage of being eyewitnesses to the resurrection, who would not have been able to touch the side of the risen Lord. But we still say to this day, come and see. We say it to those who do not know the Old Testament. We say it to those who do not know about Christ. We say it to those who may think that they know Christ and his church, but have received a twisted version of it. Because, and because of this, this twisted version, they reject the church. I mean, how many times, I can't count how many times I've heard people who were abused or harmed supposedly in the name of Christ. It's, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And this includes all religious, all the religious so-called wars of the past. I mean, think about it. What, what's the, one of the biggest things, you know, people point out, oh, well, you, you know, well, you did the Crusades. I, I hate that example, but, you know, they'll use the Crusades or the, oh, the 30, 30 Years' War or the Hundred Years' War or the, you know, which war, you know, yeah, Throughout Europe, there were just war after war after war, all supposedly based on religion. If you get deeper, it's really about politics. But people use faith. They use this as, an exam as a means of, of other ends. And they twist the faith. And people look at that and they go, I don't want anything to do with that. So people have been, been harmed by the church in some ways. Um, and so they reject it. So we say, come and see the people, because as St. Paul wrote in Romans, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? People need to hear the good news. They need to hear that invitation. They need to hear, come and see. But what are they going to see? With us, they'll see the icons, which can bring them close to the Lord and his saints which can be that window to heaven. But more than that, they need to see Christ in each one of us. We are also icons of Christ, as I said. We are also his flesh and bones, since we partake of the holy body and blood of Christ. We're even more than an icon. We, we, are, we share our very flesh with Christ. Now, it's, it's interesting. I heard on, on uh, Ancient Faith Radio a program that had a little bit about this. It just... Just, I heard the tail end of a program, and this guy made an amazing statement, and I thought, i got to look this up. So I confirmed what he said. Thank you, Google. <laughs> that when a mother is pregnant, some of the cells of the baby migrate through the placenta and into her brain. <coughs> and there's a lifelong physical connection between a mother and a child. You know, just think of that. You know, they, they've, they'll, they'll find, like, male DNA in the brain of a mom because her son left some DNA. It just kind of migrated in there. Um, think of the implications for the Theotokos in Christ. 
Isn't that amazing when you think about that? She actually, some of his DNA probably went into her, her brain as well. Now, in our theology, we believe that we partake of the body and blood of Christ. We, too, become connected with Christ in this same physical, though mystical way. Our flesh becomes Christ's flesh. We are one with Christ and with each other in a deeply profound manner. When we say, come and see to a person outside of the church, then we had better have something for them to see. We can give them the incense, the beautiful worship, and of course the beautiful icons, but most of all, we are called to give them the love of Christ, so that when they do come and see, they will have truly seen Christ living and working through us. On the Sunday of Orthodoxy, let us remember our high calling to be icons ourselves. Let us heed the words of St. Paul in today's epistle. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God.